The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, conventions, past and future, the promise of great stories to come, and what do we do all day? And why are we here? God knows. <laughs> he really does. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Rocchio. And I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. Got a bit of a different show for you this week, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be joined in a moment by Christopher Cifani, the other editorial assistant here at Bain, and together the three of us are going to give you a bit of a look forward to all things Bain coming up in the next few months, so stay tuned for that. And of course we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. That's all coming up. Now here's the news. With the newsletter out over the weekend, e-arcs are in the air. What's an e-arc, you ask? Well, if you ask Tony Daniel, he might tell you that an e-arc is a strange form of prehistoric butterfly with wingspans of up to 40 feet known for feasting on tiny dinosaurs. But he'd be lying to you. There's no such thing. No, an e-arc is an electronic advance reader's copy. Every publisher has them and uses them to share books out to reviewers and book buyers the world over. But because we're Bain Books, we slap them online and make them available for you, so you can read select titles months early, typos, glitches, and all, for the reader who just can't wait. First up in the eARC department is The Golden Gate by Robert Butner. When the world's richest man is the victim of a car bomb and literally blown off the Golden Gate Bridge, the attack is attributed to terrorists and the world moves on. But some still wonder, was Manuel Calibri targeted because... As Silicon Valley rumor has it, he was about to make the dream that people alive today can live to be 1,000 come true. Two people are pursuing the truth. Tech journalist Kate Boyle and recovering Iraq War veteran Ben Shepard race through the Bay Area, chasing the only clues the reclusive Calibri left behind. They discover not only each other, but a cosmic secret that can change human history and may cost them their lives. And for fans of the Ring of Fire series, we have 1636, the Ottoman onslaught from the man himself, Eric Flint. The long-feared attack on Austria by the Ottoman Empire has begun. Armed with new weapons inspired by the time-displaced Americans of Grantville, the Turks are determined to do what they were unable to do in the universe the Americans came from. Capture Vienna. The Ottomans have the advantage of being able to study the failings and errors of their own campaigns in a future they can now avoid. They are led by the young, dynamic, and ruthless Murad IV, the most capable emperor the Ottomans have produced in a century. They are equipped with weapons that would have seemed fantastical to the Turks of that other universe. Airships, breech-loading rifles, rockets, and even primitive tanks. The E-Arc Editions of The Golden Gate by Robert Butner and 1636 The Ottoman Onslaught by Eric Flint are now available for purchase at BainEbooks.com. want to welcome Christopher Rocchio and Christopher Cifani to the podcast today. How's it going? All right, Tony. How are you? What's up? So, uh, all right. Let, let me just make sure that I can say Christopher Chifani's name right, because it's been almost two years, and I've probably been saying it differently every time I say it. No, you got it right got today. It, finally got it right. I know I got Rocchio right, finally. Okay. So the, you guys are, um, are, I don't know what we call you, editorial assistants, assistant editors, something like that. What, what, do you, um, what would you say you are here at Bain? Uh, I always go by editorial assistant. Uh, I was told to sign my emails editorial and marketing assistant, um, but sometimes I'll just cut the marketing part out. All right. Um, well, you both um, you both started as interns, right? Yep. yep. So before we uh, – I want to talk about Bain's stuff that we've been doing um, and kind of uh, get an uh, office update, but um, 
before we go any further, kind of explain um, what you guys do here at the main offices. Uh, so I handle pretty much all of the shipping that goes through the office here, um, uh, both in and out for the most part. Uh, I work with uh, everyone in the office to make sure that things that need to go places get there. Um, this means working with our marketing team, with office manager, with uh, the editors to se uh, send out books and manuscripts and get them to reviewers and uh, bookstores and to copy editors. Yeah. And you also, um, when things need reordering um, from the warehouse, say, you can um, you, you can have something to do with that as well for, yes, that's for correct. independent booksellers or something like that. But um, one thing that we don't, from the office, we don't actually have the books that we print. Um, what we do is, um, is, is do mailings for promotional purposes, right? For, correct. We have a... A huge mailing list, and it's it's quite a task, right? To yeah, I've uh, learned some weird intricacies of Microsoft Excel uh, and things you have to have to finagle to get uh, labels to print out just right, like dropping zeros from zip codes and things like that. Stuff that just is weird and arcane. Hmm. But somehow we get and and what we're doing is we're sending them out to booksellers. Um, reviewers and uh, folks like that right to yes uh to bookstores who will and reviewers who will post stuff about about us on social media or uh, who want to see what's coming up to know what to buy uh and who have just been friends to the company and, and do, do right by us yeah so um that's one thing the other thing that you do christopher is um christopher Chifani is it's really you know we won't even go in with the doubling of names that's here at why Maine. they call me r <laughs> that's yeah. the other thing we do see is um is uh you are um a the the sort of arbiter the beginning reader on the uh, bain fantasy award the adventure fantasy award right? yeah it's one of the most interesting things i do and i really love doing it um it's it's fascinating to see the array of stories that, that come in each year, um, and they've been getting better each year. We just uh, completed our third year this summer, uh, and it'll be opening, should be opening up for submissions again in January, most likely. Uh, and I don't, I'm not involved with the other award we do, but I should mention that it is currently open for submissions, the Jim Bain Memorial Award, which is a uh, near future science fiction award and that is currently open for submissions the fantasy award which is high adventure fantasy is uh will, will open for submissions in january yeah the uh well at some point we're going to have a 10th anniversary um print edition uh in 2017 of the jim bain memorial uh oh, that's cool short i didn't story know that award coming out yeah William Ledbetter, who administers the contest for us, is putting together. He's going to edit that, so that's going to be really cool. I'm pretty sure that's a fall book. We will see. Is that going to be just the first place winners, or are we going to? Uh, no, it's going to be our judgment and probably David Drake's as well of of the best of of the lot. So, if a story was really strong, but there was a you know it was a strong year. Um, we still will maybe print out. Um, so a couple second, third place. We'll yeah, we're going to pick cool. the strongest of the strong in our our humble opinions and and put that out. So, um, so uh, Christopher Rocchio, what are you doing around here? Well, my primary function is to manage our social media channels. We're on Twitter, of course, uh, at Bain Books. We're on uh, Facebook at facebook.com slash Bain Books. Uh, we're on YouTube now at youtubes.com uh, slash show. Wouldn't let us do Bane Books for some mysterious YouTube reason. And we're on Goodreads as well, uh, Only, although we're only on Goodreads to do giveaway contests, which are advertised uh, specifically on Twitter and Facebook as well. So there's not much going on over there, but if you want free books, check that out. But uh, as I say, my primary function is to uh, to get the news to you through these different channels, because... Some people might not be signed up for the Bain newsletter, but they follow us on Twitter. It's just, you know, to try and, you know, spread the uh, spread the word as widely as possible. I also, um, if you go to any of these conventions, Dragon Con, Liberty Con, etc., and you see a, an advertisement in the program book, uh, that's me. I don't design them, but I finagle all of our 
uh, our, our graphic design team and and whatnot, and make sure everything gets where it needs to go. Uh, we figure out what book gets advertised where, that sort of thing. And those are the biggest things I do. I, I mean, obviously, if anyone tells me to do anything, I'll get it done. Yeah. Um, well, the um, yeah, you're a you're a, a guy that we both of you are guys. We yeah. dump stuff onto. <laughs> The Christophers at Bain are the ones who get the odd jobs. Yeah. Although we all do pretty odd jobs here from that, from time to time. This is an odd job, period. Like, yeah. Well, you know. Crucial, but who the heck has responsibility for it kind of jobs? We have to have somebody to do it. So, um, so the as far as the ads go, which is which is where I started out with um with, well, I started as a slush reader, but beyond that, I started writing ad copy. Um, we do it a lot. This, we, we, we don't necessarily advertise in the same venues, but um, it's, it's a process that we do the same way, right? And now um, we have uh, David Osharad is writing our ad copy. Yeah, he does the, the text for the ads, and the graphics come in from uh, either from Jason Ainspen or from, uh, or from Jenny. Uh, who does? You know, she's one of our cover designers. Jenny Ferries. Yeah. Jenny Ferries. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, yeah, there are a couple Jennies too, aren't there? Um, yes, <laughs> we have two Jennies. Yeah, the the Bain economy of names. Yeah. Um, and so what I do is I contact the conventions and figure out what it is they require from a technical specs standpoint, how big the ad needs to be, and then I work and figure out which authors are going to be there because I also coordinate uh, to manage the events calendar that you find on the website that tells you which authors are going to be where, when they're having signings, when they're going to be at conventions. Um, if you're Michael Z. Williamson, when you'll be at the Gun and Knife show. I mean, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I figure out who's going to be where. and Or uh, a lot of Bane writers, actually, when they're going to be at the... Well, yeah, there's just there's been a joke on, on Twitter lately. Um, Michael Williamson got in his schedule before everyone else. So for a couple weeks, the Bane calendar was uh, the end of this year, and then all of Mike Williamson's appearances next year. So it looked like we were the the Mike Williamson show, uh, uh, yeah. which was pretty. Which well, was he makes fun. his living, uh, in, in addition to being an author, uh, by um, running his uh, his his knife shop. Yeah, yeah, which I is, uh, uh, what short pointy things I believe. We'll talk to Michael uh, C. Williamson about his new book, Angel Eyes, coming up um, in a, in a week or two. By the way, so so um, what is? Let's talk about Bain stuff that uh, that that you guys have been involved with in, in the last year, and that is coming up in particular that that maybe listeners would be interested in knowing about. Particularly, uh, well, I, we're going to do Dragon Con again next year. Yeah, we will uh, be. We will be at Dragon Con. We already have our hotel rooms booked because you have to. <laughs> More or less the day after. Yeah, yeah, Dragon Con is always a highlight of the year, both yeah. in terms of enjoyment and levels of stress. It is, uh, it, it's an undertaking, but it, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy going. Why is it um, important for Bane, Dragon Con in particular? We should lay that out. Dragon Con is a fans convention, and we really love the fans. We. We know that the fans are what makes Bane so great, and Dragon Con is one of the best fan conventions, and it's a great uh, Southeast convention. Um, I mean, the great Southeast convention that I've been to, certainly. Yeah. It's enormous, and it's uh, it, right. It's in the Southeastern United States, and we have a we have a disproportionate number of Bane authors who live in in the Southeastern U.S. Um, and we're here too, of course. Yeah, we and, didn't have to drive too far. Yeah, so um, so a lot of them will show up for Dragon Con, right? It's a huge convention and it has a lot of Bane authors, and so we always try to to have a presence there. Um, what did we do this year? I was there, but I can barely remember it. I was so well. You had your family with you. <laughs> Plus doing everything, yeah, you know, it's a bit of running around. So you were you were distracted. One of the, we always have a road show, but we also have a, we have a booth um, at the, and we don't always or even often have, um, you know, because we most publishing companies are, including us, we're not retailers. We we sell through book sellers, so we don't always um, we, we won't have a booth at many places. And but indeed, at Dragon Con, we partner with a bookseller. Um, who, who we like a lot, uh, in order to be a face for the company, but also so that people can and actually buy the books um, through the bookseller that we work with at DragonCon. 
So we'll make, what do we do at the booth? We, it's a lot of it is about signings, right? That's the primary focus of the booth at DragonCon is a place for our authors to come and sign as Bane authors. Uh, and it's arranged with the bookseller and we'll have our schedule up ahead of time and posted at the booth. And you can come by and meet and talk to the authors. Uh, our booth is often a pretty good place to get a, some more one-on-one -on -one time, like talking to an author. And I've always found authors to be some of the most fascinating people to talk to um, because they're always interesting and know a lot of weird and uh, random things uh, and like to talk about them for the most part, uh, especially uh, Bane authors, I think, are very loquacious and interesting and uh, and random. Who were some of the authors we had signing this year at Dragon Con? Uh, let's see. We had we had John Ringo. Uh, we had Mike Williamson. We had uh, Timothy Zahn. Uh, uh, Sonia Lyris was there. Mercedes Lackey. Uh, who am I missing? Eric uh, Flint. Eric Flint. And uh, Chuck Gannon. Yeah, uh, Eric Flint, Chuck Gannon. Uh, Dave Coe was there. Um, there, was, there was quite a list. Uh, I was there. Also, Tony was here. Yes. <laughs> To Tony Daniel, There's who that. is a Bane author, yeah. Dragon Hammer, buy it. Yeah, so um, yeah, and it's fun, and the, and people come by, and you can talk to them. Uh, additionally, yeah. this year uh, we had a sort of central attraction to our booth, uh, which was a large uh, standy, uh, like put your face in and be part of the cover cover blow up from. Uh, Larry Korea and John Ringo's Monster Hunter Grunge. Uh, Christopher, why don't you talk about that since you arranged having it made and all that? Yeah, it was actually the Sinners cover. Oh, um, sorry. And it yes. will be it will be a Dragon Con again next year. That seems to be the uh, the going plan. Um, well, the Sinners, uh, it's it's not out yet. Right? Sinners so comes out in was, December, I think. But we had Grunge out as uh, it, Grunge Monster Hunter Memoirs Grunge is a collaboration between. Um, Larry Korea and John Ringo set in Larry's Monster Hunter universe, which we have, you know, we've interviewed them both about on the podcast, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that, um, it's really cool. A lot of people were, were, are really jazzed about these two authors coming together to write this stuff. And, um, so, so grunge is out and Monster Hunter Memoirs grunge and centers is coming out. We wanted to promote the whole series at Dragon Con. Um, and so we had this thing, so explain what this thing is, since um, it it was very odd. Oh, well, like, like like it moved many people to tears. <laughs> Not quite to tears, <laughs> but or something. <laughs> well, like no, like Christopher Fon here was saying is um, it was you know you you know you go to carnivals or, or uh, beachside attractions and you see these these like wood painted murals where they've got the faces cut out so you could stick your face through and and be a hula dancer or whatever. We did one of those. Uh, but it was the cover for Monster Hunter Sinners, and we chose Sinners specifically because the uh, the monster on it was one uh, that you could easily put a person's face onto the face of. Uh, so if you want to be a monster jumping at um, jumping at a, an MH uh, MHI employee with a bazooka, this is the uh, this is the cover for you. Uh, <laughs> so people were coming up and they were sticking their face through and and posting it online. Uh, it was it was very cool. Um, so that that is what that was. Yeah, that I think was... our my favorite picture of it, uh, which is up on our Facebook page, is uh, one of our office cats having his head stuck through. <laughs> <laughs> it was tricky to uh, coordinate that because cats. It's hurting but, cats, yeah. But it was a a, a fun picture. Yeah, and it's the the thing is just it was rather enormous and oh yeah, it's eight <laughs> it was, feet tall. It's very big. Uh, it when was, it's fully unfolded, it's quite a thing. So um. Uh, we're gonna do. We're gonna use it again. Uh, that's uh, that's Tony W's plan. Maybe. Oh. Wow. Okay. Um, well, it's cool, Tony. Yeah, it's big. So, yeah, I was uh, skeptical, but it was a hit at Dragon Con, and it looked really good. Yeah, it did. It looked pretty cool. So, um, what's coming up in the as far as events? Where? What if we you wanted to go to a signing um, in the coming year, or meet an author? Um, or do something bane -y. So the first thing that comes to mind, because it's very soon now, uh, is if you're in the Raleigh-Durham area, uh, HonorCon is on Halloween weekend, uh, and it's a convention dedicated primarily to uh, David Weber's Honor Harrington series, although it is 
uh, branching out uh, Claudia Christensen from Babylon 5 will be there as an author guest, mm -hmm. uh, as well as other military notable military science fiction uh, authors. Yeah, that is, that's, so far it's been every year at Halloween in the Raleigh-Durham area, I think, so. And there's an, a sister convention that they have, right? That, in uh, Minneapolis, I believe, Manticon. Manticon, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that's already happened this year. Yeah. So it'll, the, ne the next yeah. one's a little bit So Honorcon's coming up, which will be fun for anybody that, that loves Weber stuff. And it's an amazing uh, chance to see every kind of, accurate uniform from the Royal Manticorn Navy as well. They're is... a really impressive fan group. They really know their stuff. They're really detail oriented. Their uh, uniforms look great. I mean, right off the page. Yeah. A lot of them are either military or veterans or, or, you know, and they're really good at organizing these things too. The conventions go off very well for some reason. So, yeah, which is uh, not hard to fathom, actually. David Weber was at DragonCon a couple of years ago, and I was tasked as the Bane person to make sure that he had uh, a good time at DragonCon and got to where he needed to go. And it was helped immensely by um, a couple of members of the Royal Manticore and Navy fan group, um, who some of whom are involved in the organization at DragonCon, and uh, some of whom are just fans who like to be helpful and they were enormously helpful my job would have been much more difficult without them yeah and they have real tree cats no no, no. they don't have real tree cats <laughs> they do have some pretty cool looking tree cap tree cat props though that's true yeah so uh next thing that uh what's a, what's a bane event that's going to be um well, I know one thing we're going to do is we're going to have a booth at uh, the American Library Association winter meeting in Atlanta. So um, if anybody is a librarian or goes to the ALA, um, um, an institutional kind of person um, who's listening, we're going to be near the Simon Schuster booth this year, uh, which is uh, very cool. And I'll probably be there. And we'll see how I, we just found out about it. And so we don't have a whole huge amount of plans, but I'm pretty sure that, that our big promo is going to be our new YA um, series by Travis Taylor and uh, Jody Lynn Nye, which is called something or another, but it's about a scientist on the moon and some kids that work with him. Moonbeam. The, yeah, the, the, first the book, book is called Moonbeam. Moonbeam. I'm not sure what the overall series title is, although it has one. It's just escaping me at the moment. But it's going to, and it's, uh, Moonbeam is really cool. Um, it is, uh, it's about kids doing cool stuff on the moon and trying to not get hit by solar flare in the first one um, and trying to survive and help others. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's middle grade, popular, uh, and, and the, it, the kids are, um, the, it's not going to be something about kids being depressed. It's going to be about kids who like science doing cool stuff and being uh, rising to the occasion. Um, Try to recapture some of that age of tomorrow optimism. Yeah, yeah. And Heinlein, Juvie kind of stuff. So um, anyway, so we're going to do that. Um, and what other big conventions do we have a presence at in 2017? Um We'll be back to Dragon Con. There's Liberty Con. Liberty Con is, was the one I was going to say. Yeah. Um, it's not a huge convention. I think it caps out around 500 attendees, but it seems like more or less everyone who writes for Bain is always at Liberty Con, and I know a lot of you listening to this know that. Uh, but that's that's one of the big ones on the calendar. They're dragging me out to that one this yeah. year. Liberty Look Con is in? Uh, it's in Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. uh, and another convention that I'll mention, um, in the summer of uh, 2017, because I'm involved with our Bane Fantasy Adventure Award, uh, which we do in conjunction with Gen Con, which is uh, one of the biggest gaming conventions, maybe the biggest gaming convention in the U.S. at least, um, for general gaming in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. And we do it in conjunction with their writer symposium. They've been growing their writer writing track and their... Uh, I, th I actually think the writer symposium is its own... Atta attached to the convention but its own thing really promoting uh growing writers and and liter and literary awareness and we're really pleased to be partnered with them on that yeah that's cool gen con is in what city uh indiana indianapolis indiana 
Yeah, and it's generally end of July, early August. Or yeah, that like. that sounds right. Yeah, so that'll be happening. So one thing, uh, the Jim Day Memorial Award is given at the International Space Development Conference every year, um, and one of the main editors will usually be there to present it at, at a banquet, and uh, those things are really cool. They're just full of um, space scientists. Um, usually you can see, you know, Elon Musk wandering around, that kind of thing. Have you met him. Elon Musk? Time out. No, but I've seen him. Ah. Um, he looks kind of like a like a, a nerdy version of Christopher Walken to me. <laughs> So, oh, he's uh, so cool, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, you went last year. Where was it this yeah, year? Yeah, it was in Puerto Rico, which was really cool. I went to Puerto Rico. Yeah, they let Tony um, go on all the cool trips. I've been to the one in, uh, I've been to the one in um, Toronto and somewhere else, uh, Washington, D.C. Usually we alternate me and Tony and uh, Tony Waskoff and Jim Men's uh, because they're usually in pretty cool places. Um, and Toronto was even literally cool. So, or was, yeah, it was in Toronto. It'd be a relief in the middle of the summer, so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we, we also give out an award at Dragon Con, right? Which, that's F. Sherrod's reward, right? Yeah, that... yeah. The, uh, the year's best military and adventure, uh, science fiction anthologies, which, uh, David F. Sherrod, who is, uh, was it, cont- what do we call him? It's the editor. Well, I mean, he also works with us. Yeah, contributing editor Con- at yeah. Bain, yeah. He's one of, he's a contributing editor here at Bain, but he also edits this anthology series, comes out every June um, for the past two years, and we're doing a third one next June, and he goes around to, uh, he, David F. Sherrod reads everything. Um, he just, the entire science fiction short story output, I swear David knows all of them for the past several years. Um and he reads everything, and he curates this really excellent and, and fairly eclectic collection of uh, space opera and military science fiction and hard science fiction stories, all with a bit of an adventure bent, and they go into this anthology. And every year at Dragon Con, um, we, uh, we conduct a – well, prior to Dragon Con, we, we conduct a, a poll on the Bane website for which short story in that particular anthology is the best one. And the winner receives a plaque at Dragon Con as well as uh, $500 cash. Uh, David Drake won this year. Mike Williamson won the first one. Uh, so who will win uh, round three? That's up to you, ladies and gentlemen. So be sure when that book comes out in June that you vote uh, if you want your favorite author to win not only a, a prize but a cash prize, um, which uh, not a lot of literary awards have that component. And uh, – Authors like to get paid. So. That is true. That's very true, and that's you know that was Tony's uh, um, instigation of uh, of that, so that um, people would pay, so that authors would pay attention to it, which is you know five hundred bucks makes somebody sit up, yeah, as opposed to a cute statue. So, um, so uh, what else? Uh, what else? Do we have anything particular? Um, any any promotions and what's next year is going to be the year of Weber for one thing it's an anniversary year I think for the honorverse right are we going to uh is that not this year I think it's this year is the 25th 25th anniversary was this year we have a big Mason alignment um finishing up of of that storyline so uh he finished but he's going to have another uh there's going to be another big um big honor book coming up very soon it's gonna it's gonna be a big culminating storyline as well um next year so look for that i'm not sure what we're calling it yet but um whoever's going to be working on it very soon now was that the last yeah. one i or is it just the last one in the story arc i'd been uh shadow of victory that's coming that's out or it's coming right. out it's, it's out. coming out on the first but the one right. after that is shadow of victory is a um is the the culmination, the finishing of the uh, the big Mason alignment um, story arc, which has been going through the uh, the Honor Harrington books for for um, probably the last six books or so, including the Crown of Slaves series, where it um, is important as well, kind of central to that uh, Eric Flint David uh, Weber series as well. So so we got Weber. Um, we have. Uh, a continuation of John Ringo's um, uh, Black Tide Rising series with some um, co-authored books that are gonna that are gonna be out 
Which co-authored as well. You know? Uh, let's see. Who's writing it? Uh, is it Mike Massa? I believe that's correct. I, Massa. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Met him at Dragon Con. Cool yeah, guy. Yeah, very cool guy. Uh, former Navy SEAL, which is very impressive. Um, and a uh, really good writer. Really liked his story that was in the... Um, that was in that anthology, Black Tide Rising. We had a huge Black Tide Rising signing at um, Dragon Con. I think nine of the authors well. were there. Yeah, um, which was cool. So um, we have that. Larry Korea is coming out with a new Monster Hunter um, book, and uh, you as know. well as working on a man- Monster Hunter uh, short story anthology with editor Brian Thomas Schmidt, who does a lot of anthologies with us. Yeah, we're going to have a Monster Hunter short story anthology. And, uh, and of course, Drake will, will be continuing, I believe, with the RCN book. And uh, oh, we got all kind of good stuff coming up. Fans uh, of Leon Miller's uh, Leaden series, there will be a new book of that coming out. Yeah, yeah um, Gathering Edge. Uh, a small but ardent group of fans love PC Hodgel's Ken Sarath books, and there's a new one of those coming out. Yeah, we got that. Um, and many, many more uh, coming up. Uh, anything else that we uh, we might mention that we can think of that... Uh, new titles? I think we hit all the high points. Yeah, well, 2017 things um, will be a BEA uh, again, as usual. So anyone that uh, is a bookseller or is um, just a somebody who goes to um, to BEA, which uh, many people just go because it's such a huge and cool uh, book oriented conference. Um, I forget who we're. Ha- I think we're having Larry Korea there again this year. So, um, all right. Uh, I think that sums up some of our our great upcoming stuff. Thank you guys for bringing us up to date. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. Sure. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend, the cyberspy Adele Mundy. The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad, even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Coursera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. A dozen men and two or three women relaxed in chairs on the manor's wide veranda as Daniel mounted the three broad steps up from the plaza. Several men and one of the women wore uniforms, but the only person to acknowledge Daniel was an older man in a rumpled jacket and a saucer hat which had seen better days. He nodded and Daniel nodded back, a merchant skipper greeting a fellow. Like was calling to like. Naval officers weren't the only collegial group, although Daniel had come to feel that way during his years in the RCN. Daniel smiled. Groups were not only inclusive, they were exclusive if you let them be. I'll make an effort not to let that happen to me in the future. The double doors were open, so he walked through into the lobby. There were chairs of several different styles, mostly wood, but a number of plastic extrusions, and at least one steel unit that had come from a starship and was bolted to the floor as if it were still on a ship. There were spacers who weren't comfortable sitting on something that wasn't really solid. Right, called the man standing behind a long waist-high table. A computer sat on one end of the table, but he was sorting through a tray of hard copy beside it. Need a room? I am looking for the harbor master, Daniel said. I haven't decided about a room yet. Suit yourself, the clerk said equably. He pointed through the archway to his left and said, Turn to starboard and go down to the end of the corridor. All the town offices are on that end of this floor. He grinned and added, Don't be surprised if nobody's in the office. Sometimes David's chatting with Tommy in the customs office, though. The lobby ceiling was over 20 feet high. 
The round windows in the top range allowed enough light to read by at this time of day. The lobby was pleasantly cooler than the air outside had been, though the doors were open. Area lights hung in clusters from the ceiling, but the cans into which they'd been installed were brass and appeared to have been hand-pieced in the distant past. It looks like a nice enough place, Hogg said as they started down the hall beyond the archway. To tell the truth, I'm feeling overdressed. He patted the barrel of his submachine gun with the fingers of his left hand. He was the only openly armed person that they'd seen in the building. Nobody's complaining, Hogg, Daniel said, and I'm certainly not. The last door on the right-hand side was open, but the office was empty. Daniel turned, wondering which office was customs and whether it was even on this corridor. A man was hurrying toward them from one of the rooms they had passed, making an effort to button his blue jacket. You're the guys with the arms shipment? The fellow said. I'm Callet, the harbor master. Go into the office, will you, and tell me. He followed Daniel and Hogg into the office and slipped between them to the workstation on the desk. Who's your sponsor? I didn't get that from your transmission. Sponsor, Daniel said. Polarizing blinds turned the room's two windows a startling red, but the light passing through them was neutral. I'm the Kaisha's owner, if that's what you mean. No, no, Callet said. He typed with his index fingers alone, scowling in determination. I mean, which party are you delivering to? Oh, said Daniel. He hadn't sat on either of the rickety chairs facing the desk. He wasn't sure they would hold him. The transformationists. Callet stopped typing and stared at Daniel. Them? He said. Why, well, you got enough guns for a division aboard. What are those dreamers going to do with a load like that? Daniel shrugged. That's not my problem, he said. They were loaded free on board on Cinnabar, and I'm delivering them to the consignee here. My purser's talking with a local agent now. The Kaisha carried a thousand carbines and ten automatic impellers, enough small arms to equip an understrength regiment, perhaps, but not a division of any civilized planet. Daniel smiled at the thought. Look, I'm not sure I can clear this, Callet said. He grubbed a bandana from the side pocket of his jacket and wiped the sudden sweat from his forehead. There's going to be trouble, I know it. Daniel rested his knuckles on the desk and leaned onto them. There won't be any trouble with me if you do your job, he said, hearing his voice roughen. I, Callet said. Master, Hogg said, moving slightly to put his back against the sidewall. A group of people crowded into the doorway, blocking one another's passage and snarling. First to enter was the woman wearing a gray business suit that wasn't quite a uniform. The two men, who did wear uniforms, had shoved one another apart and she slipped through. The men followed instantly. More armed men crowded the hall, but they halted at the doorway. Hawkner, the woman said. She was tall and wore her hair as a tight sheath for her skull. She'd been a brunette, but had let her hair go mostly gray instead of dyeing it. You know the rules, no thugs in the manor. Do you want to be the moron who made the garrison outlaws to everybody on the planet? Do you want to explain to Murciello what you've done? The bulky man with red hair and a shaggy beard wore what seemed to be garrison utilities with a great deal of gold braid at it. Though he clenched a fist at his side, he turned to the doorway and said, Billy. Take the company outside. I don't need you here. I'm Eugenia Tibbs, administrator of the Self-Defense Regiment, the woman said briskly to Daniel. I'm here to purchase your cargo. The Corsair and Navy will better any other offer you get here, said the other man, tall and very dapper with thin curling mustaches and a pointed goatee. I'm Captain Simona, and I can transfer the credits to you before we leave this room. I have precedent, Simona. Tibbs said, turning quickly back to Daniel, she said in an attempt to be jolly. I assure you that the regiment is by far the best funded and most trustworthy organization on Corsera. Now look here, Simona said. Now both of you piss ants shut up, Hockner said. His shoulder boards bore the two solid squares of a captain in the Alliance Army. The garrison had been enrolled in Alliance service and probably used the same insignia. In fact, Hockner said, backing to put himself between Daniel and the faction leaders whom he was facing. Why don't you both get your asses out of here? The garrison's the only real power here on Corsera, however much you lots swank around with your Pantellarian accents. Excuse me, sir, Daniel said. 
he tapped Hockner's right shoulder. You're crowding me. Hockner slapped at Daniel's hand without turning around. Then move back, he said, while both exile leaders gabbled at him in rising voices. The harbor master, Callet, had moved into the corner behind his desk. He watched the verbal brawl with a miserable expression. Daniel grabbed Hockner's right wrist with his left hand and bent it up behind his back. Hockner roared and spun to his right. Daniel punched the bigger man in the pit of the stomach. Hockner gasped. Because he was already off balance, he fell forward onto his knees. With difficulty, he managed to stretch out his right hand so that he didn't sprawl on his face. Want me to put the boot in, master? Hogg said hopefully. I don't think that will be necessary, Hogg, said Daniel. He stepped forward and put his back to the harbor master's desk so that all three faction representatives were in his range of vision. Callet was certainly not a threat. I appreciate that you all find this matter to be important, Daniel said calmly. But you're dealing with the wrong party. My cargo belongs to the consignee, the transformationist community. You need to deal with them. What's he doing, said Mistress Tibbs, glancing to Daniel's side. His eyes followed hers. Hogg snicked open the blade of his knife and bent over Hockner. Daniel frowned, though he didn't object aloud. He didn't remember Hogg exceeding what he thought his master would consider reasonable, or at least would consider on the edge of reasonable. Hogg used his right little finger to jerk slack in Hockner's gun belt, then sliced through the leather. He pulled up the portion containing the holstered pistol, then straightened, closed the knife, and dropped it into a baggy pocket. I'm just looking ahead, lady, Hogg said. Like a peasant learns to do, you know, and... His tone hadn't been friendly before. Now it rasped like a cross-cut saw. I'm a freeborn citizen of Cinnabar, not a thug. And I'm good enough for this manor or any bloody place on Corsera, got it? Forgive my question, citizen, Tibbs said. There was laughter in her eyes, if not quite in her words. I assure you, I didn't believe that your master needed thugs to protect him from such as Captain Hockner. We'll go now, I think. Daniel said. He turned his head toward the harbor master. Master Callet, I will take it that I fulfilled my obligations to the port authorities. If there's some additional form to sign or the like, please bring it to the Kaisha, and I'll see that it's taken care of. He nodded to Tibbs, then Simona. Mistress, he said. Captain, I don't believe we have any business to transact, but you can find me on my ship if there is. Hogg dropped the holster on the floor and thrust the pistol under his belt. It was a standard alliance service weapon, much like the RCN equivalent, which Daniel wore when formality required him to. Daniel was quite a good shot with long arms, but he didn't like handguns. I'll call on you shortly, Captain, Simona said brightly as Daniel walked past. And I, said Administrator Tibbs. Daniel and Hogg walked through the lobby at the same businesslike pace as when they had entered. The desk clerk called. Decided on a room? I'm going to look up an old girlfriend first, Daniel said. I may be back. He'd thought of taking a room to camouflage his intentions. He certainly wasn't going to sleep away from his command after that meeting, but he decided he wanted to get back to the ship as quickly as possible. Under other circumstances, the manor might have been a pleasant change from the cramped quarters of a tramp freighter, but the center of brotherhood was a bomb ready for a spark. The civilians had no choice but to stay. But Daniel did, and he was exercising it. Thirty or forty garrison soldiers stood or sat on the veranda. They looked ill at ease, but not hostile, rather like a pack of dogs milling in an unfamiliar environment. Daniel nodded bare acknowledgement to the squat fellow with Sergeant Major Bars, but he stepped past briskly to avoid a chance of conversation. The civilians had moved on. Hogg had kept his face front to avoid eye contact, which in his case might have meant a challenge. Hogg could look like a simple rustic, but he didn't have Daniel's skill at projecting friendly confidence when he was expecting everything to blow up in an instant. Think we're going to have to shoot our way out of this? Hogg said as they crossed the plaza at a quicker pace than they'd kept when they approached. I don't think so, no, Daniel said. But I'll admit that I've been wishing I'd spent more time on pistol practice when I had the leisure. I'll give you this. Hogg said, patting the submachine gun's barrel with his left hand, the hand that wasn't on the grip. Hockner's piece ought to do all right for me. They started down the slope toward the harbor. 
The Kaisha's plasma cannon seemed to be locked, it probably wasn't, straight ahead, because anything else would arouse comment. In the cross trees of the raised mast was a crewman with a long canvas-wrapped bundle, almost certainly a stocked impeller. Without using his goggles magnification, Daniel couldn't identify the spacer, but from his size he was probably Barnes, which meant Sun was at the controls of the plasma cannon. I hope we're being unreasonably concerned, Daniel said. If we're not, though, I couldn't ask for better people around us than we've got. Hogg grunted. After a moment, he said, I hope the mistress is aboard when we get there. I figure we're going to need some magic on this one, and I don't know a better magician than her. Chapter 13 Brotherhood on Coursera There'll be guards at the front entrance, Tovera said, eyeing the side of the building as they walked along Ridge Road toward the plaza. It wouldn't be any trick to get in through one of those windows, and there's a door in the alley that looks like it's into the basement. There may not have been anybody down there in fifty years. There's no reason they shouldn't allow access by an off-planet scholar, Tovera, Adele said. I want real access to the collections, not a peek and escaping in a hail of gunfire. If simply asking doesn't get us in, I'll consider other methods. The five ground floor windows along this side were grated. Though the wrought iron bars looked sturdy, over the centuries the bolts fastening them to the wall had wept long trails of rust down the pale limestone. A pry bar would pop the gratings off, likely enough, and the two upper ranges of windows didn't have even that much protection. A squad of garrison soldiers had built a shelter by stretching a tarpaulin between the palace front and two of the trees protected by ancient stone curbs along this edge of the plaza. The troops had moved chairs and couches into the shade and were cooking on a grill which generated power from a fuel cell. It was enameled field gray and was probably military issue. None of the soldiers was female, but half a dozen civilian women ate and drank with the guards. Another soldier sat in the recessed doorway. He was either asleep or so close to it that Adele could have stepped around his legs and entered unchallenged if she had wished to. Excuse me, my good man, she said primly. The doorway was arched. The wooden panel, which was still closed, was carved with half a complex coat of arms. I'm here to view the Gulkander Library. Will you direct me, please? Was that? said the soldier, jerking alert. He straightened, banging his head against the stone. The carbine slipped off his lap and the steel butt plate clattered on the pavement. He grabbed for his weapon. Adele flinched internally, though if the carbine had gone off, the slug would have taken the soldier in the belly without endangering her or Tovera. The indicator on the weapon's receiver showed that there was a loaded magazine in place, which wasn't always a certainty with troops of this quality. How do I go about viewing the Gulkander Library, please? Adele repeated calmly. So far as she could tell, the other guards were ignoring what was going on in the doorway. Tovera kept an eye on them, however, while smiling in bland innocence. Ma'am, the soldier repeated, blinking at her. Ma'am, you better ask the LT. Lieutenant Pastis, I mean. He put a palm on the threshold as though he were about to stand up. He held that pose with his mouth open, however, until Adele and Tovera had gone through the door. A broad corridor ran down the center of the interior. The coffered ceilings on the ground floor were fifteen feet high. They reminded Adele of those of Chatsworth Minor when she was a child. As an adult and titular owner of the townhouse now, she spent no more time on the ground floor than it took her to climb the stairs to her own apartments on the third and fourth floors. But when she was a child, she had wandered throughout the house. Her parents had used the rooms on the ground floor to entertain their more common, vulgar political guests. The ward healers and... Adele was now sure, the men whose gangs protected popular party rallies from hecklers and who broke up opposition rallies. It was garishly romantic when Adele was a child. I really was a child, she realized, or I could have been. Adele did not regret her childhood any more than she regretted the weather. It simply was. She had been quiet and bookish from the first. Her father was always on the public stage, whether or not there was another human being present, and her mother was too immersed in ideas to notice facts. 
Neither had been concerned that their older daughter lived in a world of information and arrangements of information instead of playing with other children. And why should they have cared? Adele had access to everything she wanted. She had used that access to hone her skills to an exceptional, perhaps a unique degree. She was a productive member of society to the degree that mattered. It hadn't mattered to Adele herself until she met Daniel Leary and became a member of his society, his family, the RCN. The space to the left of the entrance was open. It had probably been a waiting room for those attending the governor. Now it was railed off into an orderly room containing two clerks at consoles and a desk behind which a lieutenant sat comparing the flimsy in his right hand with the flimsy in his left. From his scowl, the comparison wasn't going well. Excuse me, Adele said, sharply enough to get anybody's attention. I'm here to view the Gulkander Library. I'm Lady Mundy on Coursera as a Cinnabar envoy. That wasn't quite a lie, but it was close enough to make Adele uncomfortable. But I wish to see the library as a private citizen. Bloody hell, the lieutenant muttered. The hand-lettered card on his desk read, Adjutant. Look, if you need your hand held, you're out of luck. The books were moved to storage in the basement, and I don't have any bloody idea of what you'll find. I'll be all right, I think, Adele said, no more dryly than she said most things. She looked down the corridor. How do I get to the storage area? The room which balanced the orderly room on the right side of the front had brass-mounted double doors. The valves were closed, showing holes where the original decoration, probably a brass coat of arms, had been removed. In its place now was the legend, Commander-in-Chief. The letters had been cut freehand with a great deal of skill from white enameled sheet metal. Ranged on both sides of the hallway were plush chairs, which matched the couches outside the guards. They would serve for people waiting, but they appeared simply to have been moved out of the way when the rooms were converted to garrison use. Farther back were three doors on either side, mostly open. Between the first and second on the right side was a staircase leading upward. You see the stairs? The lieutenant said, pointing. Well, the door beside it, that's the way down. And good luck to you. Thank you, Adele said, more polite than the fellow's behavior required. She strode toward the indicated doorway. She might have to come back for a key. And besides, she preferred to be polite. Tovera, ahead of her, had opened the door with no difficulty and peered in. The only light is glow strips in the ceiling, she said when Adele joined her. Not many, and they're dusty. It will serve, Adele said. The basement appeared to be as deep as the ground floor ceilings were high. She started down the metal stairs. I'll wait here in the hall, mistress, Tovera said, being more formal than usual, because others might overhear the conversation. I don't think you'll need my expertise in this venue. I agree, Adele said as the door closed above her. Dovera meant that her mistress wouldn't need a bodyguard in this dim, barren expanse of concrete pillars and accumulated trash. Unless a pack of dust mites attacked, perhaps. No doubt Tovera would rush down when she heard Adele begin shooting at mites. Otherwise, Tovera sitting in the hall outside the door was in a better position to defend her mistress than she would have been down here in the gloom. The stacks of books were at some distance from the bottom of the staircase, and they were in much better order than Adele had expected to find them. Broken furniture and odds and ends of other trash, sports equipment, a perambulator with three wheels, similar items, had accumulated around the staircase over the years. But book movers had cleared a path through it so that they could place their loads near a wall and even cover them with plastic sheeting. Adele wondered whether the job had been done by the Gulkander family's librarian rather than the garrison soldiers. She had braced herself to find ancient volumes tossed down the stairs to fall any which way on the clutter. She squatted. This wasn't ideal either, but Adele had learned a long time ago that the only ideal she could expect to find was the silence of death. She smiled wryly, and if the many religious believers were correct, she might not have even that to look forward to. Adele removed a layer of sheeting from a stack at random and began a preliminary assessment of the books. Her personal data unit had an external light, but rather than use it, she let the unit scan and record the spines through various sensors and project the result on its holographic display. Adele watched and was dumbfounded. Antique books could have meant anything. 
Brother Graves was an educated man, but he wasn't a bibliophile, and he had probably not seen the collection personally. This could have been a gathering of genealogical records from Yerevan or wherever the Gulkander family came from originally. These books were pre-hiatus. At least some of these books were printed on Earth before Starflight. These books were sitting in a dusty cellar among trash. The Gulkander descendants couldn't have known what they were worth let alone appreciate what they were. Or they would have sold them generations ago, and certainly no other person on Coursera understood now. That was unfair. The librarian must have had an inkling to have taken as much care as he had, while doubtless under pressure from Philistines with guns to move faster. Perhaps Adele would be able to find the fellow after things had settled down here. Adele wasn't sure how long she had remained, lost in a wonderful garden, before Tovera had moved her hand through the holographic screen and said, Mistress, we have to move. Murciello's bodyguard is going to capture the Kaisha. There's been no electronic signal, so whoever's on communications watch wasn't able to warn Six. Adele came out of her brief visit to Paradise. Explain, she said. She set down her data unit and carefully closed the book on top of the stack, a volume of Chaucer published by the Kelmscott Press. She wondered if she would think first of the book if someone appeared in the doorway and began shooting down at them. I probably would. Tovera could deal with the attacker. Captain Hockner, commander of Murciello's bodyguard company, came in shouting, Tovera said. He tried to push Six around and hadn't been pleased. Her tone was as dry as a salt desert, but nonetheless, Adele could feel the amusement and pride underlying the words, with the result. He told Murciello they had to seize the cargo. He'd take his company and pick up the company already at the harbor before anybody had time to react. The adjutant started arguing with him, and Murciello couldn't understand what the fuss was. Adele put the volume back on top of the stack where she had found it, then dragged the plastic film back over the books. Perhaps she could come back and properly curate this splendid collection, but that would require that she survive the next few minutes. They were all shouting at the top of their lungs, Tovera said, so I could follow what was going on. I was afraid that I'd call attention to myself if I got up to warn you before Hockner and his troops went out. I want to say that the gunfire would have warned you, but as focused as you get, I'm not sure that would have worked. Yes, said Adele. We won't be able to reach the ship ahead of the troops ourselves, so I'll send a warning and we'll attempt to conceal ourselves until matters sort themselves out. Hide here in the basement, Tovera said. Her tone was neutral, but she was certainly intelligent enough to doubt that it was a good idea. No, said Adele. Find the alley door that we saw coming past and open it while I warn the others. Opening the door might be a matter of turning the latch, or alternatively, it might mean blowing the panel off with beads of plastic explosive. Tovera would choose the method which seemed best to her, and Adele would live with that choice. She was quite sure the door would be opened. Signals to ship, Adele said. Her data unit was coupled to one of the consoles in the orderly room above. From there, the heavy fleck she had seen running into a hole hacked in the molded ceiling would carry it to the transmitter and to the antenna on the roof. Emergency, garrison troops, two companies at the start, are about to seize the ship and her cargo. The other factions aren't involved at this time. She took a deep breath. She must next explain her own plans, which meant she had to formulate them. Tovera and I will make our way to the harbor, but we won't attempt to board the ship at this time, she said. We will proceed as circumstances dictate. Oh, and in two minutes, the garrison transmitter will begin jamming all short and medium wave frequencies. Signals out. Adele gave the garrison console a further set of instructions with quick movements of her wands. She stood, slipping the data unit into its pocket. The door's open, Tovera said. She gripped her small submachine gun openly in her right hand. The attaché case in which she normally concealed it was in her left, still holding equipment of occasional use. The submachine gun was of frequent use. Adele drew her own pistol. We'll head for the harbor quietly, she said. Not to Grave's office, Tovera said as she led Adele between concrete pillars to where she'd located the door. I don't want to involve Brother Graves in this business, Adele said. And apart from that courtesy, she thought Graves would be a hindrance in the firefight, which seemed likely to break out at any moment.
That was another segment from our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a pile of proofreading work and media mailings along with hours of answering the phone for the two Bane Christophers, Giovanni and Rocchio, who really should get back to work now. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. Bye.